Chagulanyi sent him Robert. Swear in the name of the Almighty God. When Robert Chagulanyi threw a heart into the ring in 2017 and was elected Chadunda East MP, many dismissed him as a greenhorn who stood no chance if he sought the highest seat in the land. Upon his announcement in 2019 that he would seek the presidency, the creeping hand of the state intruded the creative and performing arts industry and set the stage for a confrontation. The regime dangled the carrot for those who steered clear of elective politics and used the stick on Bob Wayne's disciples. <laughs> the Draconian Stage Plays and Public Entertainment Act of 1943, which had gathered dust on the shelves, was dusted and put to use to control musicians and other creatives. Chaglani came second in the most violent presidential poll where he scored 35%. He alleged that the election was rigged but later withdrew a court petition challenging Museveni's victory in the Supreme Court. As Chaglani's gravitas continues to grow, the state has since then reset the engagement with entertainers. <laughs> After failing to secure audience with General Salim Saleh earlier in March for discussions, for a stimulus after more than a year of cancelled concerts occasioned by the COVID-19 pandemic, the president's brother, who is the coordinator of Operation Wealth Creation last month, convened a two-week workshop for a section of musicians. The closing day was attended by, among others, the UPDF, Joint Chief of Staff, Major General Leopold Chanda, Governor Chief Whip, Thomas Tayewa, Junior Minister for Gender and Culture, Peace Mutuzo, and Fashionista Tand, Operation Wealth Creation Director of Operations, Slavia Owori. For long spells, since the colonial era, artists, musicians and other creatives have had an uneasy relationship with the state. In the worst case scenario, artists fled to exile or suffered dire consequences such as death, like playwright Byron Kawadwa, whose famous play Olimbalwa Wankoko jolted President Idamin. In the process of creating, of course, uh, you want to talk about things that are pertinent with the people, that are going to make you popular, uh, speaking things that rhyme with the people. In the event, um, that uh, the people are complaining, the music will complain. If people are suffering, it will be reflected in the, like you remember the apartheid regimes in whatever. So um, musicians being a voice of the people, given the fact that they also hail from different backgrounds, they experience different things, or even certain people reach out to them and say, well, we want this articulated or aired. You find that there is a, um, a relationship that may not go well with the people in authority. But we promise you that we shall come back as winners. The last three decades under President Museven were marked with largely a cordial relationship until Chagulanyi joined the rough and tumble of elective politics. The music industry, like other sectors, has been ravaged by the COVID-19 pandemic. This has given the state a window of opportunity to exploit. When a person is vulnerable, um, their mind is also at risk. <laughs> uh, their mind is at risk because it can change. Uh, an, uh, an offer they can't refuse can clearly cloud their thinking. So it's a vulnerable industry for now. The government first attempted to control the performing arts and creative industry in 2010, four years after the enactment of the Copyright and Neighboring Rights Act. In 2010, a year to the general election, the Gender Ministry commenced a review 
of the Stage, Plays and Public Entertainments Act, enacted during the British colonial regime to keep performing artists on a tight leash. The artists pushed back against the proposed guidelines, only to be revived again in 2019 in the run-up to the 2021 polls. UCC was making itself a co-author of almost every work because there were many layers of approval. A person had to first take the lyrics before they sing them. Now in the case of music, in the case of film, it would be uh, the script. You first take the script, they approve the script, you go to create, you even have to show them the kind of crew, the cast you're going to use, you had to depone the budget. And then you needed also, after that, you needed another layer of approval if you needed to, to, to publish the same or broadcast the same. Clearly, it was a mambo jumbo. The creative industry, part of the civic space, is defined as the set of legal, policy, institutional, and practical conditions necessary for non state actors to access information, express themselves, associate, organize, and participate in public life. But in recent years, a litany of reports by the European Union, US State Department, and local NGOs have showed government is tightening the news around the space, especially freedom of assembly and expression. However, government rejects this view. We are not a lawless society. We allow different partners to do their work, but they must do it within the framework of the law. So when we feel or find out that maybe there is a breach of the law in one way or the other. For instance, if you are a non-governmental organization and uh, you are supposed to do the work as clearly put in the instruments which give you space to operate, but then you go outside, you for instance go into partisan politics, then the state brings you to order. For the last 10 years, Uganda in the Freedom House Freedom Index has been ranked either as unfree or partially free or repressed. Uh, these assessments are done based on the legal system, based on the response of the government to basic freedom such as assembly and association, free speech, uh, literally, governments respond to, to democratic freedoms. There are so many indicators that show that civic space in a certain country is either shrinking or closing. And one of the indicators is the enjoyment of freedom of expression, association and assembly in a given country. We know that this is provided for under Article 29 of the Constitution. But if you look at the Hado, for example, for citizens to express themselves in a simple and illegal protest, it cannot happen, I think, for the 27 years of the enactment of the 1995 constitution. Throughout the election campaigns, President Museven accused Chaglanyi and other non-state actors of being agents of a neo-colonial agenda while intelligence agencies commenced a punch targeting international donor agencies, including deportation of high-profile individuals who were directly in charge of financial watchlists for civic education and election-related activities. The government in January pulled the plug on the Democratic Governance Facility, DGF, a multi-donor outfit established by eight EU countries, which bankrolled nearly 100 NGOs. Earlier on, government had halted the activities of Give Directly, an international non-profit bank rolled by the U.S. government, which had embarked on a cash transfer program to the urban poor affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, what we, we really are, are we really, uh, very often we are presented as uh, enemies. Is, is it? President M7 then directed the ministries of finance and foreign affairs, respectively, 
to re-examine the working of DGF as a precondition for its reopening. Five months later, discussions are yet to yield results and DGF remains suspended. Sara Bidete, the Executive Director of Center for Constitutional Governance, says that there are several laws that have been enacted to torpedo freedom of expression and assembly and curtail the activities of civil society. We have reached a period where the state wants to control citizens' conversations. And this is evidenced in the laws that we have that contradict the Constitution. We have 16 laws that contradict Article 29 of the Constitution. And these are laws enacted by the same state, same regime that enacted the Constitution. We have, and, and they are deliberate. It's not that they are not aware of the Constitution. These laws are deliberate. Beretta cited Section 7, 44 and 45 of the 2016 NGO Act, which contradict Articles 23 and 38 of the Constitution. The 2011 Computer Misuse Act, whose definition section needs to be amended to include government, which is the most culpable in violating provisions of the law. The 2013 UCC Act, whose interpretation section is too broad and unfair because it includes functions that are meant for association and expression. The 2010 Regulations of Interception of Communications Act, which violates Article 27 of the Constitution. The 2013 Anti-Money Laundering Act, whose section on proceeds of crime is too wide, a scope and provisions could lead to victimization. So you have seven organizations whose bank accounts have been frozen on allegations of laundering money, on allegations of funding terrorism. No single NGO leader, save for Nicholas, has been produced in court. So you have seven organizations, one NGO leader. Even for the case where Nicholas Opio was charged with the Under Ant Money Laundering Act, there is want of prosecution in that case. And I doubt that there will be any single day when the state will produce anything credible. Surveillance and things like that. Because all of those are made legal under the Data Protection and the Privacy Act. Of course, among other laws. But selective application of these laws, all biased application of the laws, eh, which is used to now just um, foster um, a, a particular selfish interest is what now causes the problem. Other controversial laws include the Public Order Management Act, which has been challenged in court. Challenging the Public Order Management Act, and it took six, seven years. Then court gave a ruling outlawing Section 8 of the Public Order Management Act. Now the state has appealed, it might take another five years. So you have 12 years of dealing with an illegal law that contradicts the Constitution. Obviously, deliberately contradicts the Constitution to take away people's rights on, 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 in participation in their, in their governance. So we are going to see more of these acts. Even where the laws don't exist, the practices of the duty bearers are arbitrary. So we have a web of laws that are being enacted that whittles away, uh, that nibbles at the edges of freedoms provided for in Chapter 4 of our Constitution. And this is deliberate. I think that the, 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 the Constitution is, you know, essentially being eroded by these legislations that are being passed, um, not to expand the frontiers of rights, but rather to restrict it, to constrain it. Um, and, and in so many ways, uh, many of these laws are in themselves unconstitutional. Information Minister Chris Badiomonsi told NTV they consult widely before enacting laws. And why one may see that selective maybe it impacts on his or her work, but uh, the beauty of it is that we have a democratic process where the public participates in the formulation of these laws because before the drafts 
uh, come to cabinet. There is have a consultation by the ministries which propose these laws, and also these laws are tabled in the parliament. Members of parliament are expected to consult their constituents. The committees in the parliament which handle these laws also carry out consultations. And uh, by the time the parliament pronounces itself on particular provisions of the law, there has been the participation of the whole country. He said government has the oversight role over non-state actors. So I know the people who complain mainly are opposition actors. Actors. Yes, the opposition and multi-party politics is allowed, but both the ruling party and the opposition parties must conform to the laws of the land. Nicolas Sopio of Chapter 4, who was arrested last December and charged with money laundering, said the writing of a shrinking civic space is on the wall. There's no doubt that Museveni is a setting sun. The problem with it is that the setting sun doesn't want to accept that it is setting, and therefore wants to hang up in the sky for as long as it can. And that anybody else who is trying to point to the fact that your days, your best days are behind you, is therefore seen as an enemy of the state. So there's going to be difficult times ahead, there's no doubt. The longer President Museveni stays in power, the more widespread discontent will spread in this country. And his response and, 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 and in dealing with that is going to be, or has been, in three ways. The first is he will use repression, whether physical repression or legal repression. There are accusations that the Anti-Money Laundering Act, which seeks to protect governments from the proceeds of illicit funds and the exploits of terrorist networks, has been selectively used to curtail funding to civil society. Before we send any information to the police, we are persuaded from our side that there's something. But remember, this is intelligence. It now becomes the responsibility of police to transform this intelligence into, uh, into actual evidence that can be used, that can be assessed by the DPP. And if the DPP is persuaded that the evidence is, is, is enough to sustain the charge, beyond reasonable doubt, the DPP then takes the matter to, uh, to court. That is the sequence. So in other words, to answer your question, we do not send matters to the police where we are not ourselves persuaded. Civic space is the bedrock of any open and democratic society. When civic space is open, citizens and civil society organizations are able to organize, participate and communicate without hindrance. The scope for citizen action is constrained and slipping away with the rise of authoritarian leaders in the West who espouse the brand of illiberal democracy. Here in Africa, tin pot despots continue to imitate the actions of these authoritarian leaders in the West.